Welcome to today's briefing, where we delve into the latest developments shaping global security and international relations. In the Middle East, a rare Israeli airstrike in Beirut has killed a high-ranking Hezbollah commander and over a dozen others, further escalating tensions in the region. Israel has also confirmed the death of Hezbollah's second-in-command, prompting legal challenges at the International Criminal Court over Gaza-related arrest warrant requests. Meanwhile, the Iranian supreme leader has pardoned nearly 3,000 prisoners, a move that raises questions about political stability. The UN has condemned the use of weaponized communication devices in Lebanon, highlighting the ongoing complexity of regional conflicts. In Eastern Europe, the situation remains dire as Russia continues its aggressive campaign, striking a geriatric center and power grid in Ukraine, and bombing a civilian ship in Odessa. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's visit to Kyiv underscores the EU's commitment to supporting Ukraine amid these hostilities. Concerns over security are echoed in Germany, where plans are underway to install missile defense systems on government jets, while in the Balkans, Kosovo's Prime Minister Kurti accuses the West of appeasing Serbia in light of Russia's actions. On another front, violence from the Sinaloa cartel has claimed over 100 lives in Mexico, and tensions escalate as China imposes bans on imports from Taiwan, further straining cross-strait relations. In the Philippines, a senator is investigating former local leaders' ties to Chinese crime syndicates, indicating the pervasive influence of organized crime in the region. Join us as we explore these critical issues and their implications for international stability and security. Rare Israeli airstrike in Beirut kills Hezbollah commander and over a dozen others. Israel launched a rare airstrike on Beirut, killing Ibrahim Akil, a senior Hezbollah commander, along with 14 others, in a densely populated neighborhood. Akil was a key figure in Hezbollah's military operations and was sanctioned by the U.S. for his involvement in the 1983 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut. This airstrike, the deadliest in Beirut in decades, follows an escalating conflict between Israel and Hezbollah. Hours before the strike, Hezbollah launched 140 rockets at northern Israel. In response, Israel targeted Akil and other militants in a Beirut high-rise, causing widespread damage and injuries. The attack occurred during rush hour, and first responders are still working through the rubble. Hezbollah vowed retaliation, while Israel remains on high alert, positioning military forces along its northern border. This escalation comes amid a broader regional conflict, with tensions between Israel, Hezbollah, and Hamas continuing to grow. Israel confirms killing of Hezbollah's second-in-command. Israel has confirmed the death of Ibrahim Akil, Hezbollah's second-in-command, in a targeted airstrike on Friday in Beirut. Akil, a senior figure in Hezbollah's elite Radwan force, was killed alongside 10 other commanders. Lebanese authorities report at least 12 dead and 59 injured in the attack. Akil had been wanted by the U.S. for over 40 years for his role in the 1983 bombing of the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, with a $7 million bounty on his head. The airstrike occurred during intense fighting between Israel and Hezbollah, with Hezbollah launching 140 Katusha rockets into northern Israel. Earlier that day, Israel destroyed over 100 Hezbollah rocket launchers in one of its largest bombardments since October. Tensions continue to rise as fears grow of a wider regional conflict following deadly explosions in Lebanon earlier in the week. Israel submits challenges to ICC over Gaza arrest warrant requests. Israel has formally submitted legal challenges to the International Criminal Court, ICC, regarding its jurisdiction and the legality of arrest warrants for Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, over their handling of the Gaza War. The ICC warrants were initially requested in May. The Israeli Foreign Ministry argued that the ICC lacks jurisdiction and that the prosecutor failed to allow Israel the opportunity to conduct its own investigation before proceeding with the warrants. ICC prosecutor Karim Khan, however, maintains that the court has jurisdiction over war crimes in the occupied Palestinian territories. The warrants also target Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar, alongside other Palestinian figures, for war crimes and crimes against humanity. Both Israel and Palestinian leaders have denied war crimes allegations, but the ICC's proceedings could further delay any rulings on the warrants. This comes amid the ongoing Gaza conflict, with over 40,000 Palestinians killed and significant casualties on both sides. Cornell professor Russell Rickford under fire again for anti-Israel protest.
Cornell University professor Russell Rickford is facing renewed criticism for joining an anti-Israel protest on campus this week, where demonstrators were heard chanting, Long live the Intifada. Rickford, who previously described Hamas's October 7th attack on southern Israel as exhilarating, was seen marching with protesters, many of whom were carrying Palestinian flags and calling for Cornell to divest from genocide. The protest disrupted a career fair with demonstrators pushing past campus police and leaving guests feeling threatened. While Rickford didn't participate in the disruption inside, his presence sparked outrage among students. He had previously apologized for his controversial remarks, which praised the Hamas attack that killed over 1,200 people, including American civilians. Cornell officials have condemned the protest and stated that those involved will face disciplinary action. Rickford who specializes in African-American political culture and has made other controversial political statements in the past, remains a divisive figure on campus. Iran's Supreme Leader Pardons Nearly 3,000 Prisoners Iran's Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, has pardoned or commuted the sentences of nearly 3,000 prisoners, following a written request from the head of the judiciary, Golam Hossein Mohseni A.J. The pardons, granted in celebration of the Islamic prophet Muhammad's and Shia scholar Jafar al-Sadiq's birthdays, include sentence reductions and conversions of death penalties into prison terms for 59 convicts. According to Iranian state media, over 1,200 prisoners are set to be released, while more than 1,500 will receive reduced sentences. The pardons also extended to 40 foreign inmates. Khamenei often issues pardons around Islamic holidays, which the Iranian leadership frames as an act of mercy. While the religious leadership promotes these gestures, activists argue that they serve to distract from ongoing government repression. Last year, tens of thousands were pardoned after nationwide protests in Iran, including notable political figures like Faize Hashemi, the daughter of the late former president Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani. Hashemi was released early this week, after serving time following her arrest during the 2022 protests. UN condemns use of weaponized communication devices in Lebanon. In a significant development, the United Nations Human Rights Chief, Volker Turk, condemned the use of ordinary communication devices, like pagers and two-way radios, as weapons, saying it violates international law. This follows the deadly explosions in Lebanon on Tuesday and Wednesday, which reportedly killed 37 people and injured over 3,400. During an emergency UN Security Council meeting, Turk called for an independent investigation into these attacks, which Lebanon claims were carried out by Israel, allegedly targeting Hezbollah, but resulting in widespread civilian casualties. Lebanon's foreign minister, Abdallah Bouhabib, held Israel responsible, showing graphic images of the aftermath and citing a now-deleted tweet by an advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu as evidence of Israel's involvement. However, Israel's UN... Ambassador Danny Danon did not comment directly on the attacks but emphasized Israel's ongoing efforts to minimize civilian casualties while combating Hezbollah. The use of such devices as explosive weapons not only violates human rights law but could also constitute war crimes, Turk said. He stressed that even in the face of new warfare tactics, international laws must be respected. While Israel accused Hezbollah and its backer Iran of escalating the violence, Iran's UN ambassador blamed Israel for the attacks and promised accountability. As tensions rise, UN officials are warning that the situation in the region is at risk of spiraling into catastrophe unless urgent diplomatic measures are taken. Russia strikes Ukraine's geriatric center and power grid. Russian forces launched a devastating airstrike on a geriatric center in Sumy, Ukraine, as part of a larger wave of attacks targeting the country's power infrastructure. One civilian was killed and 12 others injured, as elderly patients had to be evacuated from the damaged five-story building. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said rescue teams were searching for those possibly trapped under the rubble. Ukraine's air force reported it had shot down 42 drones and a missile, but Russia's repeated attacks on the Sumy region, located near the Russian border, have caused significant power outages. The Ukrainian Energy Ministry said power cuts are now affecting 10 regions, straining resources as the critical winter months approach. International bodies, including the UN and the International Criminal Court, condemned the targeting of Ukraine's energy infrastructure, calling it a violation of humanitarian law and a potential war crime. Russia continues to argue that power infrastructure is a legitimate military target, dismissing these charges. Despite the assaults, Ukraine's military reported diminishing the Russian forces' assault potential in the Donetsk region. 
though fighting remains intense near the cities of Pokrovsk and Kurakov. However, Russia claims it has recaptured villages in the Kursk region, diverting thousands of troops to the area. As winter looms, the European Union is taking steps to support Ukraine by dismantling a Lithuanian fuel power plant and rebuilding it in Ukraine, aiming to help stabilize the country's energy grid amid ongoing attacks. Russia bombs civilian ship in Odessa. In a significant escalation, Russian forces launched a missile attack on the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, hitting a civilian ship and port infrastructure. The vessel flying the Antiguan flag was damaged and at least four people were injured in the strike, according to Odessa's regional governor, Ole Keeper. The missile used in the attack was identified as an Iskander M, a ballistic missile capable of traveling at supersonic speeds with a range of up to 500 kilometers. The missile's debris caused severe damage to both the port and the civilian infrastructure in the area. Air raid sirens echoed across Odessa Oblast in the early afternoon, and the first strikes were heard shortly after. Odessa has frequently been the target of Russian missile and drone attacks in recent months. This strike comes after Ukraine accused Russia of targeting a civilian grain vessel last week en route from Odessa to Egypt with a missile near Romanian waters. On July 4th, a previous missile attack on Odessa's port killed one civilian and injured seven others. Russia's continued targeting of civilian vessels and infrastructure raises concerns over the safety of maritime operations and the region's stability, especially as Odessa remains a crucial hub for Ukrainian exports. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen arrives in Kiev to discuss support for Ukraine. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has arrived in Kiev for her eighth visit to Ukraine, aiming to discuss crucial issues as the winter season approaches. Von der Leyen highlighted the importance of preparing for winter, especially as Russia continues to target Ukraine's energy infrastructure. She emphasized Europe's ongoing support, including defense, humanitarian aid, and financial backing. One major point of discussion is the 160 million euros allocated from frozen Russian assets. This sum will go toward meeting Ukraine's urgent humanitarian needs this winter. Russia's attacks have knocked out approximately 9 gigawatts of Ukraine's energy infrastructure equivalent to the total energy consumption of the three Baltic states. To help stabilize Ukraine's energy grid, von der Leyen also revealed plans for the EU to restore 2.5 gigawatts of power generating capacity and increase energy exports to supply 2 additional gigawatts of electricity to Ukraine. During her visit, she will meet with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and other top officials to continue discussing Europe's commitment to Ukraine, especially as it faces ongoing challenges in the war. Germany to install missile defense systems on government jets. Germany is moving forward with plans to enhance the safety of its top government leaders by installing missile defense systems on three new government jets. According to a report from Spiegel, the country's defense ministry will submit a contract to the Parliamentary Budget Committee for approval by the end of the year. These A350 jets, mainly used by President Frank-Walter Steinmeier, Chancellor Olaf Scholz, and Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock, will be equipped with advanced infrared systems on their fuselage. The system can disable incoming missiles by using laser pulses to confuse and disable their seeker heads. The first of these jets was handed over to the German military in June, and installation will be completed in stages to ensure continuous availability of the planes. The cutting-edge technology comes from Israeli defense firm Elbit, in collaboration with German parts supplier Deal. While many military transport aircraft already have this technology, this will be the first time it's used on government planes. The Defense Ministry has not yet commented on how the other government aircraft are currently protected from missile threats. Kosovo PM Kurdi accuses West of appeasement towards Serbia amid Russia concerns. In a recent interview in Brussels, Kosovo Prime Minister Albin Kurdi criticized Western officials for what he describes as appeasement towards Serbia, motivated by exaggerated fears of Serbia aligning more closely with Russia. Kurdi claims that the European Union is not effectively mediating the implementation of an EU-brokered agreement aimed at normalizing relations between Kosovo and Serbia, two nations with a turbulent history. Since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2022, Serbia has been trying to balance its historical ties with Moscow and its relations with the West, which is crucial for investment. While Serbia has condemned the invasion, it has not joined Western sanctions against Russia, and there are reports of Serbian munitions reaching Ukrainian forces, though the Serbian government denies supplying them. 
Curti pointed out that EU and US officials have blamed him for the lack of progress on the normalization deal, which was established in March of last year. However, he argued that the West has overlooked Serbia's violations of the agreement, stating, whenever Belgrade violated the agreement, Brussels did not act. He expressed his desire for the EU to take a stronger stance against Serbia's actions, noting that the ongoing appeasement is counterproductive. Kurti emphasized that Kosovo, which declared independence from Serbia in 2008, an action not recognized by Serbia with support from Russia, needs to be treated as a legitimate state. The EU has placed restrictions on economic aid to Kurti's government due to violence in northern Kosovo and has criticized him for not establishing a self-governing association for Serb-majority municipalities. While Kurti is open to discussions on self-management for Serbs, he refuses to accept anything that could undermine Kosovo's sovereignty. He also highlighted the need to address broader issues between the two nations, such as the opening of a key bridge in the divided city of Mitrovica. This bridge symbolizes the ongoing division, currently open only to pedestrians. Kurdi's administration is pushing to open it to vehicle traffic, despite concerns that this could escalate tensions. He concluded by asserting the importance of normalizing Kosovo and emphasized that keeping the bridge closed serves the interests of those in Serbia who wish to maintain a divide. Sinaloa cartel violence claims over 100 lives in Mexico. In a tragic escalation of violence, more than 100 people have been reported killed or missing in Mexico's Sinaloa state amid a fierce war between rival factions of the Sinaloa cartel. Local authorities confirm that at least 53 people have been killed and 51 are missing since clashes erupted on September 9th. The conflict was triggered by the arrest of legendary drug trafficker Ismael El Mayo Zambada in the United States back in July. Zambada alleges that he was kidnapped by a senior member of the rival Los Chapitos faction and taken to the U.S. against his will. Since the violence erupted, Culiacan, the capital of Sinaloa, has experienced numerous shootouts, forcing schools to close and businesses to shut down early for safety. Governor Ruben Rocha Moya reported that over 40 arrests have been made in connection to the violence, and more than 5,000 food packages have been distributed to affected families. In a related development, Mexican military forces captured Fernando Perez Medina, known as LP, who is said to be the head of security for Ivan Archibaldo Guzman, the leader of Los Chapitos and son of the notorious Joaquin El Chapo Guzman. On an unusual note, Mexico's Federal Attorney for Environmental Protection reported that they are providing resources to help a tigress tied to a tree, a situation caused by the drug lord's penchant for keeping exotic animals as pets. Veterinarians have refused to assist due to safety concerns, prompting authorities to prepare military resources for the rescue. President Andres Manuel López Obrador commented on the violence, stating that the United States shares some responsibility for the instability, referring to the earlier surrender talks involving U.S. officials and Joaquín Guzmán López, the trafficker accused of kidnapping Zambada. U.S. officials have confirmed discussions with Guzmán, but expressed surprise at finding Zambada on U.S. soil insisting that no American resources or personnel were involved in the kidnapping. As the violence continues to rage, the impact on the local population grows increasingly dire. U.S. nears approval for $567 million security aid package to Taiwan. In a significant move, the United States is on the brink of finalizing a $567 million security aid package to Taiwan, marking the largest such assistance to date. This decision, which is sure to provoke frustration in Beijing, is expected to receive presidential approval before the end of the fiscal year. The aid will be delivered swiftly through the U.S. military's own stockpiles, a strategy that has been effectively employed to support Ukraine. This new package nearly doubles the $345 million sent to Taiwan last year. Taiwan remains a sensitive topic in U.S.-China relations, with Beijing asserting that the island is part of its territory and not ruling out military action to assert control. Conversely, the U.S. is Taiwan's oldest and largest supplier of military assistance. Recently, during the Shangri-La Dialogue, a major defense summit, Chinese Defense Minister Admiral Dong Jun warned that those supporting Taiwanese independence would face consequences, reflecting the ongoing tensions. A Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson criticized U.S. military support, suggesting it bolsters separatist sentiments. However, there have been moments of diplomatic engagement. At a recent defense conference in Beijing, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Chinese officials, hinting at a willingness to communicate amidst rising tensions. 
This new security assistance will encompass various elements, including training, anti-armor weapons, air defense systems, and drones, integral to Taiwan's strategy against China's larger military. The U.S. maintains a policy of supporting Taiwan's self-defense, but rarely provides detailed accounts of the aid, given its sensitivity. Taiwan's representatives in Washington reaffirmed their commitment to enhancing defense capabilities in collaboration with the U.S. To expedite support, Congress has authorized the administration to send up to $1 billion in military stocks to Taiwan annually. While this offers a more direct form of assistance, the Pentagon has been cautious in sending equipment it cannot replace. After a pause in additional aid due to funding constraints, Congress allocated $1.9 billion in April to replenish U.S. stocks sent to Indo-Pacific allies, primarily focusing on Taiwan. The current aid package underwent several revisions, initially starting with a smaller amount before senior officials called for a more substantial figure, leading to the current $567 million. Additionally, the Pentagon is developing a third aid package for Taiwan, anticipated to be finalized before the administration ends in January. Recently, the U.S. also approved $228 million in repairs and spare parts for military equipment, contributing to Taiwan's broader military needs. Despite the urgency for aid, a recent Pentagon report highlighted challenges in delivery, including issues with moldy and expired items, raising concerns about the reliability of support and the confidence of allies in the U.S. commitment. Tensions escalate as China bans imports from Taiwan. Taiwan has officially condemned China's recent ban on imports of its fruits, vegetables, seafood, and other goods, claiming it violates World Trade Organization WTO, rules. This ban is set to take effect next week and marks a significant escalation in the ongoing tensions between Taiwan and China, which views the island as part of its territory and has expressed intentions to annex it. The Mainland Affairs Council of Taiwan criticized the ban for ignoring established trade regulations and stated it harms the interests of farmers on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. The council urged for dialogue through the WTO as a way to address the issues between the two nations. Taiwan's agricultural sector, supported by its semi-tropical climate and fertile soil, is valued at around $500 billion, complementing its high-tech industries, particularly in semiconductor production. This move by China comes amid increasing military, political, and economic pressures on Taiwan to yield to Beijing's influence. Historically, China has employed trade sanctions against various countries including Australia and South Korea in response to perceived political offenses, using its significant market as leverage. The Chinese ban seems to target rural voters in Taiwan, who have consistently supported pro-independence candidates, while local officials have been lured by Chinese incentives. As tensions rise, both sides face challenges in maintaining productive dialogue, with the WTO being one of the few platforms available for such discussions. Philippine Senator Investigates Former Mayor's Links to Chinese Crime Syndicates a Philippine Senator, Risa Hontiveros, is leading an investigation into former Mayor Alice Guo, also known as Guo Hua Ping, amid allegations of her connections to Chinese criminal syndicates. Hontiveros has not ruled out the possibility that Guo could be involved in espionage as the inquiry unfolds. Guo, who served as the mayor of Bambon and identifies as a Filipino citizen, faces multiple criminal charges, including graft, linked to her alleged abuse of power that facilitated offshore gambling operations in her town. The investigation was prompted by a casino raid in May that uncovered scams run from a property partially owned by Guo. During earlier hearings, Hontiveros questioned Guo about her potential role as an asset for China. Guo has denied these allegations, describing them as malicious. Her case has raised concerns in the Philippines, especially as tensions with China escalate over overlapping claims in the South China Sea. In court, Guo's arraignment was postponed as she seeks to have the charges dismissed. She arrived wearing a mask and a ballistic helmet. Recently removed from her position for grave misconduct, Guo also faces a money laundering complaint. Philippine President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has called for Guo to explain how online gambling operations, targeting Chinese customers where gambling is illegal, have links to organized crime. Pontiveros emphasized that the rise of Philippine offshore gaming operators, POs, has deep ties to transnational crime syndicates affecting both Filipino citizens and people worldwide, stating that the investigation is just beginning to uncover the extent of these connections.